it doesn't get any better than this. It's the popular show with me, James A. Smith, and I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome Nancy Fraser, who is Professor of Philosophy at the New School in New York City, major influence on this podcast and on my political writing, and I'm absolutely thrilled to have you on the program. Are you well, Professor Fraser? Yes, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm thrilled to be on your program. That's very, very kind. Uh, your new book is called Cannibal Capitalism, How Our System is Devouring Democracy, Care and the Planet and What We Can Do About It. It's with Verso Books. Uh, and well, there's a lot to discuss in there. Um, first of all, uh, you, you, you begin with, with Marx and with some exemplary pages of, of teaching on, on the, the work of Karl Marx. Um, Marx tells us that we get capitalism when uh, we move from uh, primitive accumulation, the, the nobles taking what they want by force, to a regime of exploitation, nominally free workers selling their uh, labour power on a labour market. But uh, as many have observed, and, and you fully th theorise here, uh, it's not simply that one system was replaced by another, there's a continuity and the expropriation uh, that Marx associates with that earlier uh, uh, regime of accumulation has continued. Maybe you could explain to our listeners what that kind of other face of exploitation yeah. of workers and capitalism is. Yeah, I mean, uh, capitalism prides itself. Its its uh, partisans are always telling us that it's uh, the only system that's really compatible with freedom. And they, of course, you could say, have a somewhat impoverished idea of what freedom is because they think that having no property uh, and, in, in a sense, therefore being essentially forced, if you want to survive, to sell your labor capacity to an owner, someone who controls the entrance to work, um, that, that, may, that that's uh, free. Um, okay, it is free in the sense that you're not you know, bound to a given master, you're not entailed on a given plot of land, you can quit one job and try to find another, and so on and so forth. Um, Marx says, uh, actually, that these workers are doubly free. They are free to sell their labor power, but they have been freed from land, tools, animals, any kind of property that would enable them to earn a living, to make a living without having to work for a capitalist. Okay, that's the, the, the Marxian story and the larger uh, common sense story that this is a system based on freedom. But the fact of the matter is that from the get-go until now, capitalism has always entwined free labor with various forms of unfree labor. Well, we know this very well from the era of, of chattel slavery, where, right, we had, uh, we had free workers in Manchester, England, producing uh, spinning uh, cotton that was supplied by slave labor in Mississippi. So it's been said, behind Manchester stands Mississippi. It's the slave labor that gave the owners access to cheap inputs, cheap raw materials, cheap energy, and, and for that matter, cheap food uh, so that they could, uh, the cost of living would be low and they could pay uh, lower wages even to their free workers. So here you have two streams of work, one free, one unfree, that are intertwined in a single system. The expropriation and the exploitation, I speak in the book of the two X's, uh, neither one works on its own. It's like two pistons of a single engine that is right uh, producing, uh, you know, so what are supposedly all these these marvels of wealth, which of course are not available to the those who produce it. So yeah, from the beginning, a a uh, an entwinement of free and unfree labor, and it didn't stop with the abolition of slavery. Uh, we could say, just as behind Manchester stood Mississippi, we can say today, behind Cupertino stands Kinshasa, right? Cupertino is the headquarters of Apple. Kinshasa is where the coltan and other rare earth medical metals that are, are needed for iPhones and for that matter, for lithium batteries and so on, are mined in some cases by enslaved 
Congolese children or semi-enslaved uh, children. So um, just think of, of sweatshops, of, of favelas, of all these um, um, brothels and trafficked people and, and so on, or uh, smuggled people who are indentured in effect. Um, you know, there's a tremendous amount of unfree labor in capitalism. It's not just an archaic vestige that is going to disappear as we finally get to real modern capitalism. On the contrary, it's an integral element of the system. That's the argument I make in the book. Yeah, and, and, and it's, a, it's a very sort of impressive map of expropriations uh, that you give in the book that ranges from the ways in which you know modern states still um, grasp the spoils of, of war uh, in, in that very kind of straightforward way, but also it, it covers the structural adjustment plans, yeah. the debts, the forced privatizations that are a routine part of foreign policy today. Uh, it covers the kind of enforced uh, debts and, and bad mortgages that people are uh, put under inside the um, imperial core countries. Right. It, it would cover medical manslaughter, all kinds of things. But it also covers the, the sort of very routine activities of care work. This has always been a major part of your analysis that for you that that counts as a kind of expropriation also. Um, I, I think yeah. some listeners might be sort of a little confused to find all those things kind of listed and grouped together under a single term. Um, maybe well, we come back on that. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I, I mean, what I want to say first, uh, in, in terms of what I was just describing about the division between expropriation and exploitation, which are sort of separate categories of work, but as I said, right, uh, imbricated. Um, the point I, I, I want to add here is that that corresponds to what W.E.B. Du Bois called the global color line. It's perhaps rough. You can find this exception here or that exception there. But in the main, right, those peoples who have been subject to expropriation in, through coerced labor uh, are dark peoples who've been conquered, vanquished, who have been deprived not only of their lands and, and, and property, as were white workers, uh, but also of access to state protection of any means of self-defense, access to rights that could actually be, you know, uh, be practiced and, and made uh, actionable. So I, I link the uh, expropriation exploitation idea with the problem of race and empire. This is all about imperialism. And so when you spoke about the IMF and, and debt and all of that, th this is just as expropriation continued after the abolition of slavery. So it continues after independence from direct rule colonialism. So in the post colony today, we have all these forms of neo-imperialism uh, no longer, right, uh, de jure colonialism, supposedly independent states, but they um, are themselves so uh, deprived of state capacity, ability to, right, even many of them don't want to protect their own citizens. It's true, they're kleptocracies and so on. But even if they wanted to, um, they don't really have the kind of state capacity that we have seen deployed on occasion, at least in the wealthy countries, the historic core of capitalism to protect citizens by means of labor regulations, environmental regulations, and so on. So this situation of being sort of defenseless and therefore not being able to draw a line and say, you can't do this to me, even if I'm free on paper, a citizen on paper, that still uh, today has a, a color line aspect to it. And one of the um, uh, great examples of this is the one you mentioned, um, the way in which um, global mega corporations and uh, financial, big financial investors are able to siphon wealth from the global South through uh, structurally adjusted sovereign debt that 
is never paid off, but just becomes larger and larger and eats up more and more of the revenues uh, of post-colonial states. So I, I call all of that expropriation. Um, it, it, and it, it, you know, the idea is there's an economic aspect of this. Uh, people do not, are not paid for the, the living costs, uh, which is part of Marx's definition of what exploitation is, right? For Marx, the worker, the free worker um, gets uh, paid for those hours in which she or he produces the, the, the amount of value that covers their living costs, their reproduction costs. Uh, the, the capitalist appropriates the surplus. That's the definition of, of exploitation. But expropriated workers, even those who nominally today work in factories or we, maybe sweatshops, irregular kinds of uh, employment, and are nominally free, they still don't receive the full uh, living costs even. Um, so that's the economic side of the story. And then there's this other side about not having full um, citizenship rights, the, the full ability to call on protections. I think those two things are the mark of race uh, as a dividing line between the various populations, all of whom are propertyless but some are treated differently from others. Now, when you get to care work, though, I, I think that's a different matter. I don't want to say that all care work is simply expropriated in, in that same way. Sure. I, want, I would say I would use a word like appropriated, which is um, a, a little uh, less violent uh, sounding. And that's the sense that I want to, uh, you know, uh, call up. Um, Care work, there are uh, situations in which care work is violently expropriated, as in chattel slavery, when enslaved women, right, were raped and, and uh, by their masters or, uh, or other white men and, you know, essentially coerced as, as breeders to replenish the slave populations or to do work uh, uh, you know, cleaning and, and, and caring for uh, their uh, white owners and so the families of their white owners. Those are real cases of expropriation, expropriated care. But there's a whole nother level here um, in, in which I would, I use a, a phrase, um, free riding. Basically business free rides on care work that is often unwaged at all, or if it is paid for, it's very underwaged. And in that sense, it has some of that uh, quality of expropriation. But this works through, um, through family, through kinship, through community. Um, the, these institutions capital relies on, and especially women, but not only, capital relies on the, the activities, the energies, the, the, the work that um, caregivers do to replenish and reproduce and nurture and socialize, right, um, the working class on which capital re relies absolutely. Without workers, you don't have capitalism, you don't have profits, you don't have surplus value, you don't have any of that stuff. And without reproductive workers, so to speak, you don't have productive workers without care. So you could say that behind the factory stands not only the plantation, but also the household and the community. That supplies another necessary condition, which appears to be outside the official economy most of the time, but is an absolutely uh, essential right, uh, support for the official economy. I don't uh, wanna call that in, in, in every form expropriation because I wanna save that word for the really violent stuff. Yeah. The really there, there are contemporary examples that you give where it does apply, of course, the, the kind of routine way in, in Silicon Valley companies where women are asked to freeze eggs uh, uh, in order to give their best working years to the yeah. company. Meanwhile, uh, often, racialized or irrigant, 
uh, women will be brought in away from their own families in order to raise these elite uh, uh, workers, kids, and so on. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it's, uh, it, it is striking that at, at the extremes, there are there are examples still where it connects in. What, what you just said about uh, about race and about care um, sort of gives a, a clue to the structure of the book, which follows through um, race, care, the environment, and the question of democracy. And, and um, although you're, you're you're very rhetorically gentle with your leftist audience. I feel like there is a very um, rigorous corrective in the book to how a lot of the contemporary left tries to approach or accommodate those different issues. Um, when you say towards the end of the book um, that uh, you, you, while, of course, you endorse the idea that socialism today must transform um, the means of production, it must also transform production's relation to its background conditions of possibility, social reproduction, public power, non-human nature, and forms of wealth that lie outside capital's official circuits, so the stuff that falls in or near uh, expropriation um that that strikes me as a, a great way of rephrasing the common leftist phrase of why not do both when usually when people on the left say that today they mean both the economic stuff and the social stuff what that means in practice is uncritically accepting whatever some bourgeois ngo has said we should be saying about social stuff and never quite getting round to the economic stuff what we have here is a demonstration that yeah of course race, gender, care, the environment uh, and democratic questions are, are, are absolutely stitched into the way in which uh, the conventional Marxist territory of the exploitation of workers, uh, uh, as far as that goes. But it, 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 this is a material analysis. This isn't about um, social representation or, or, or microaggressions and so on. Sure, those things may be important, but there are far more demanding ways in which um, material violence is happening on each of these territories. Yeah, um, I, I, I like the, the way you've, you've posed this uh, issue. I, um, I would say that I have several different kinds of targets of sort of, <laughs> okay, I don't know how gentle it is, but okay, I'll accept the gentle criticism. I mean, first of all, um, there's a, an obvious uh, um, rejection of a kind of old left idea that you know, there's sort of one major contradiction of capitalism between free labor and capital, and the it, the, uh, the 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 systems uh, revolutionary classes are the people in the factories and and the unions and so on, and everything else is somehow secondary. Uh, like uh, all sorts of uh, uh, people from the uh, currents of uh, new left thinking down to feminism, uh, environmentalism, et cetera, et cetera, anti-racism. I reject that kind of reductive view. But I don't think that the alternative is some kind of um, wishy-washy pluralism, which mm. says there are all sorts of multiple problems and um, there is over here this and over there that and, and so on and so forth. I'm trying to really insist on following a materialist, a Marxian structural method, but to sort of expand what counts as the structure of the system. And so I'm trying to show how many uh, gender issues that feminists care about, how many issues that anti-racists care about, how many issues that environmentalists care about, that Democrats care about, and so on and so forth, how these are really all tied together because they all arise in a non-accidental way from one and the same social system. Like I was saying before about the two pistons of, of, of the engine, I could make a, a similar parallel argument about the, I already started to a minute ago, about the, the centrality of care work in the system, which implants a gender division at the heart of capitalist society. It's not anything secondary, it's just a structural as the usual uh, focus on the on the division between capitalists and uh, and free workers, um, and free riding on nature is built into the system. It's not accidental that we are right facing a, a burning uh, uh, planet uh, today. In the same way that we're, it's not accidental that we're facing an acute crisis of social reproduction or care. 
Um, these are as um, deep seated in capitalism as the usual ideas about economic crisis and uh, you know economic depressions and uh, and so on. So um, I'm really trying to um, trying to take what I think is very valuable in the historic Marxian tradition and show that this kind of thinking is the kind that we need precisely just to to you know underline your point that we um, that we focus on system transformation uh, as opposed to interpersonal right difficulties yeah. which exist as you said beautifully and are real and uh, you know I too encounter them and and, and and get annoyed and try to you know fight back as best I can but the point is that um, those things are, also related, even though it's a complicated way to trace out the connections, um, those, uh, that, that there is a whole set of institutions and societal structures here, a whole social system. And unless we can get a grip on that, we don't have any chance of, you know, any kind of a decent life uh, for ourselves or for the, the people we care about or for the the population of the globe in general um, now. And it, this is not the moment to be putting all of our energy into things like microaggressions. Um, a, a useful example um, of that uh, uh, seems to be in the, the discussion of race. Um, I mean, if we go back to uh, the early modern period or the, or the, the 19th century, um, there clearly race was constructed and deployed in order to, um, as, as you describe, kind of keep the um, keep a sort of clear division between, on the one hand, usually exploited white workers and usually um, uh, expropriated uh, black workers in, in America. Um, that doesn't describe the deployment of race today or together, or only if you sort of see it in a kind of global way, does it start to kind of roughly apply. But inside the uh, rich countries, it doesn't exactly apply. Um, and uh, so that, that takes you to the question of, is a, is a non -race, does capitalism still need racism? Um, and that's another example of quite often activists will kind of, in trying to create as big a coalition as possible, they try to make people who are interested in anti-racism more sympathetic to Marxism by saying, oh, well, capitalism is inherently racist. But um, it, you sort of demonstrate that that, that that doesn't exactly describe um, the, the situation today. This is a very uh, complicated and interesting question. And I, I would love to see um, a lot more um, serious uh, work uh, exploring it because I don't think uh, that I, I can give you a, a very simple one sentence answer. I mean, first of all, it is true even in a country like the United States that, you know, when you just look at, at things like life expectancy or uh, your chances of ending up uh, in, in, a, uh, in a mass incarceration uh, prison or living in a place where the water is not safe to drink, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, the race as a, as a sort of a rough indicator of life chances is incredibly meaningful. And that is true, despite the fact that we're, you know, legally for the most part, right, we've, we've abolished most forms of de jure uh, discrimination and so on. So I, I would I insist um, that, and the, um, the, the that that people of color are still uh, subject to forms of hyper expropriation, even as white workers are also increasingly expropriated too, but in not quite the same hyper way. So I think there's still a racial element. Um, well, but but you're right that um, the the change now in a country like the United States is, and, and elsewhere too, is that formally, uh, formerly protected workers who had unions, who had good paying manufacturing jobs with job security, who earned enough in many cases 
the men so that their wives could be full-time homemakers, which was considered a mark of respectability and good status in an earlier time, uh, less so now. Um, th those people um, who seemed to have ex escaped expropriation and like ascended, shall we say, into pure exploitation, they are being, they are, uh, their situation is deteriorating and declining with the relocation of manufacturing to the uh, historic periphery or the, uh, the BRICS countries, the, the, the semi-peripheries, um, with the um, replacement of high-wage manufacturing work with precarious low-wage service work, uh, we see more and more that the historic uh, centers of white working class, quote unquote, privilege, and I use that word with a lot of irony because even in the best of days, they were not exactly privileged. But uh, those populations are in the Rust Belt, right, are, are immersed in, in opioid addiction, gun violence, suicide, Trumpism, all a QAnon. I mean, this is, they are also uh, being expropriated in the sense of not earning a living wage, which was right, the economic mark. So, and meanwhile, it, it, you know, you, you, we did have the movement of, uh, of black Americans into Fordist industry. Uh, right uh, in in the 1930s and 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 on. So things the patterns got, let's say, um, blurred or more jumbled than the strict binarism of the 19th century. Uh, yeah. That's true, but um, that and that creates a new situation for racial thinking because um, you might think at the start, well. Don't, don't black and white then have more in common today? Isn't this, haven't we finally, with the scrambling of that division, gotten to a point where they could start to see one another as allies, as more or less in the same boat? And yet, uh, what we are seeing is not, uh, in some cases we see that, but, but in many cases not. We see a ferocity of, uh, uh, of uh, a kind of white, uh, nationalist, right, um, surge uh, in, in white nationalism, uh, which I would say is is itself related to this experience of decline that, oh my God, yeah. I'm being now dragged down to their level, but I'm not like them. I, 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 that kind of thing. Walter Ben Michael's provocation yeah. is that the, the kind of end logic of anti-discrimination campaigns would be that you would be happy if uh, you had a much more unequal society, but the different income brackets correlated with the size of a, a, a pop, you know, a minority population. And it, he adds that in that respect, it's right-wing politics because it offers a justification for what has actually happened, which has been increasing. Uh, um, uh, uh, inequality, um, wh whether or not you'd go that far, it, it does seem to me that this is um, the, the, this sort of reveals the the problem that comes about when one puts race in the abstract as the primary form of analysis. You end up sounding like bad things happening to people are bad if they are happening to um, people because they're black as opposed to, first of all, bad things happening to people being a bad thing. Um, if, 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 you, if you sort of put the cart before the horse and put this sort of this um, uh, uh, sort of shifting signifier of race that's been used for different things at different times as the main kind of thing to overcome, then you end up in that, backed into that situation that Michael's, okay, is being somewhat kind of contrarian there, but it, it's... In, that's the direction that uh, the the rich countries are going in: greater equality and greater, um, you know, greater inequality of yeah. the different types. Well, we are seeing a kind of um, class recomposition, so to speak, in which there's a, a very small stratum of people of color who are making it into the professional managerial class, and 
even into you know uh, very uh, high paid um, jobs in, in banking or whatever. But th these are small numbers, but they are real, and we see uh, a whole politics uh, around what uh, Keangi Yamana Taylor calls black faces in high places. Let's you know, which is the the anti-racist equivalent, the liberal anti-racist equivalent of liberal feminist idea, let's crack the glass ceiling and get women into the highest offices and so on. These are uh, approaches that can only help a very small number of people and they essentially leave the mass of women, the mass of, uh, of, of people of color in the basement um, as ever. Um, but I think what, what I wanna say about this um, is, uh, going back to your original question, is capitalism necessarily racist? I think capitalism does need some fund of, uh, of labor that it gets very, very cheaply, whether by direct coercion or by hyper expropriative uh, credit mechanisms or, uh, or whatever. And um, I think that whoever is in that position uh, it, it, it is racialized, let's say. Yeah, is a biological seen, justification will be invented. As, you know, yeah, lazy, stupid, it's their fault, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and they are treated as, as inherently different, yeah, e either uh, by, on biological grounds or on some other cultural racist grounds. Um, now, the, the, the thing that I started to muse about a little bit in the book is if granted that um, that capitalism needs some of this cheap expropriable wealth somewhere, um, does it need such a sharp division between them, those people who we can do that to, and the rest of us who are gonna be protected from that? And I think what we're seeing now is that these, the division is less sharp, at least in terms of the actual structural systemic right character of the society. Because as I just said, plenty of white people are now subject to expropriation too. Um, so the hypothesis of a non-racial capitalism, the theory anyway, would be we now divide expropriation or distribute, I should say, expropriation quote unquote, equitably among all non-property people, whatever their color. Uh, this would be non-racial capitalism. Well, for reasons I just said, um, it's not, I don't see a path of how you get from here to there, even though I would acknowledge that in theory, it might be possible. Be but you, the path is blocked because of the history because of the white rage and, 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 and all the forms of authoritarian populism uh, and, and white nationalism that right, arise in this kind of, of setting. And, but I would just add one other point, and this touches on the, on the Walter Ben Michaels idea. Um, even if we could get to it, we don't wanna go there. This is not exactly. a good society. Exactly. A society in which we're all degraded and, and expropriated, forget it. Uh, and, and it's no wonder that people who have been protected from it in the past are in a rage and say, not me, because it's yeah. not a good outcome for anybody. Uh, the problem is they blame the wrong people. They, they have a wrong interpretation of why this is happening to them. Trump tells them that the system is rigged and he's right, it is rigged, but not in the way he describes and not by the people he thinks are doing the rigging exactly. So, um, you know, uh, the, the, the problem is we, we haven't had a, uh, a powerful, credible, widely diffused and appealing left counter narrative about why this is happening. We yeah. have had, we've had Bernie Sanders and that was the best we had in the US. Other, there've been other left populist or left socialist attempts in other countries. Um, but um, so far the, the rights narratives have, have won out. And this, yeah. this is a great tragedy.
I was going to suggest that, uh, that, yeah. that perhaps Bernie could have had that role if it wasn't for the Democratic Party machinery. You put him on stage; those Trump, a lot of those Trump guys would have uh, would have. Uh, You're absolutely would, uh, right, and plenty of them voted for him before yeah. he was removed by the Clinton yeah. um, centrist wing of the party. Yeah. Let's get on to care. Um, you you argue, um, frankly, brilliantly that uh, every phase and transformation of capitalism has had a, a, among its common threads the fact that all of them needed care in the way that you uh, described before. It needs to recreate its own workforce apart from anything else. And none of the variations of capitalism has been willing to properly place a value on it or to uh, pay for it. Um, I appreciate it's a long history, long history you tell in the book, but maybe for our listeners, you could give a sort of sketch of how that dynamic um, plays out. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think that we should think about capitalism's history in terms um, of uh, a, a sequence of phases or regimes of accumulation, which is a more technical term, but a sequence of phases punctuated by crises in which capitalism gets reinvented, it gets tweaked, it gets reformed, it gets restructured, so as to remove some of the most egregious problems that have surfaced in the previous regime, those get papered over, get diffused, get displaced, get softened, but without addressing the deep seated problem, which is this free riding of capital on these forms of wealth it doesn't want to pay for, including paradigmatically care work. And so we had, we had let's, uh, let's just start with industrial capitalism of the 19th century, where right at the outset, you have women and children being essentially conscripted to work in mines and in, in sweatshops and in very uh, dangerous situations um, because they are thought to be cheap and docile workers who are not going to fight back much, not going to resist. You can control them more easily. And then you immediately get a kind of crisis of social reproduction where you don't have the energies and the you know, the, 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 the resources available to maintain a household, to have and raise healthy children. Um, and very quickly, in Victorian England is, you know, the paradigmatic example, very quickly, you get a kind of moral panic. You have a social, a real material social reproduction crisis. And then you get a moral panic and, and middle-class reformers saying, oh my God, in, and listen, Marx and Engels uh, uh, thought that, you know, that capitalism was de-sexing proletarian women. I mean, they had some rather conventional Victorian ideas about this, too, which doesn't mean they didn't have all kinds of other great things to say. Um, but anyway, so then you get the whole drama about we're going to uh, that, that Marx writes about in volume one of Capital. We're going to have factory le legislation. We're going to. Uh, limit the hours uh, of uh, women's uh, employment. We're going to try to abolish child labor and so on and so forth. None of that actually solves the problem because the women who are then pushed out of admittedly dangerous, dirty, and low-paid work are not given an alternative source of income. They are, you know, uh, some are, are driven to, to sex work or, or, or whatever, and nobody is challenging the, the male authority in the household in any case. So th there's no solution in protective legislation. It's not until um, that form of capitalism, that liberal colonial industrial model of the 19th century, enters into a, a larger crisis in which the crisis of care is entwined with a crisis of, um, you know, free trade, uh, of uh, geopolitics, of economic uh, meltdown and depression and so on. When all of these things come to a head together, you finally get the, the political will 
to do something. It takes a very long time for this crisis to get sorted out. You go through two world wars, the rise of fascism and so on. But finally, with the New Deal in the US and the consolidation of social democracy in Europe after uh, the, the Second World War, you get a new form of capitalism, which I call state managed capitalism, but you could call it New Deal or social democratic capitalism. Because one thing it does is that it uses state power to shore up families and communities to essentially um, bolster the capacities and protect to some degree the capacity for care work and social reproduction. You do it in part by paying male workers more so that their wives can either um, stay out of the labor force altogether or only take part-time sort of respectable forms of work that are appropriate for women as the gender ideology of the time imagines. Um, but anyway, you get money put into public schools, social services, health, health insurance, unemployment insurance, uh, um, and so on and so forth. And, and so that's you know a different way of organizing the relation between production and reproduction, bringing the state in in a big way. That unravels starting in the 1970s. It's, it's unraveling is connected to the dismantling of the Bretton Woods capital controls. Those controls enabled states to control their currencies to, um, you know, to uh, deflate, to, to, uh, to do Keynesian spending on credit, to borrow, and, uh, and to shift exchange rates to their advantage and so on and so forth. That's, when that's gone, then it becomes much more difficult for states, even wealthy states, to right, play, get, afford the same generous level of social protections and, uh, and support for care work. The unraveling of that in relation to what we were talking about before the relocation, relocating of, of high wage manufacturing to the semi periphery, the change in the structure of labor markets, the uh, a new big demand, much bigger than in the previous period, for women to enter full time wage work. Uh, so we get now the new ideal is no longer the the family wage, the right that the male male breadwinner, female homemaker family ceases to be the desirable model. It's now the two earner family. And that's an idea that in a very perverse way brings together feminist aspirations to overcome women's dependency or aspirations for gender equality. That comes together in a perverse way with neoliberal projects to right, um, basically weaken uh, uh, labor unions and right, uh, develop this low wage service economy. So we are now in, an in, a in another moment uh, in which um, the uh, social reproduction, the question of care is newly front and center. And hopefully we're not gonna you know, go back to Victorian ideas of uh, of uh, protective legislation, but uh, um, to, to some new form. And of course the burning question in all of these cases is will this be another form of capitalism, which again, will not solve the problem in a definitive way. It will displace it. It will off offshore the disadvantages elsewhere if we were uh, ever to sort of get um, a robust welfare state in a country like the United States, it would be off the back of somebody else outside, uh, offshore. Um, and um, in any case, we're, um, we, it would only be postponing because mm. capital inherently structurally needs to free ride on care work. It can't pay the full reproduction cost of all of its inputs it, that would essentially destroy its profit base. And so it's always, you know, shortchanging 
racialized people, women, nature, uh, right? Um, and uh, yeah, so we, it's really time. What this history shows to me is that it's really time to transform our social system in a much deeper way so that we don't transition to a new form of capitalism that just postpones it. And by the way, given the ecological crisis, we don't have time for that anyway. Um, no, we really need to disable this, um, well, what I call in the book, this cannibalizing logic where the system devours the sources of wealth on which it depends and is therefore always tending to destabilize itself to produce new forms of crisis. And by the way, in doing that, it is devouring us. Uh, we, the, the overwhelming mass of, of people on the short end of the stick uh, across the planet, um, we, are, we, we are the meal that, is, that the cannibal is, is eating. I think that we um, also has a more specific application uh, to the left itself. Uh, it, one of the things I've taken um, uh, most powerfully from from your work is uh, is the fact that a defeated left can be a dangerous thing, uh, and uh, the the story you've just just described, where the new left and, and second wave feminism specifically didn't uh, pursue that you know, demand for a transition to something totally different after the failure of post-war state-managed capitalism and ended up instead getting in bed with a, an even more exploitative, arguably, form of capitalism with neoliberalism. We're in a very similar moment now but with a defeated left, a very fast-changing and fast-moving situation where a lot of elites with a, a lot of different kind of political orientations are suddenly speaking our language. You warned about what happened last time with that. Uh, and uh, I, I, uh, I'm always you know, recommending Fortunes of Feminism as a, a sort of warning about the left in the present and, and, and how, we, how attentive we need to be to how our, our ideas and frames of feeling kind of get, get used uh, by others in, in moments of defeat. Um, yeah. I, I, I wondered, um, I wondered if, if you, you, I wonder if you could say something about your own relationship to feminism. I mean, first off, you, 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 you are like what is best in your work. There is a direct line back to the best socialist feminism written in the 1960s. Juliet Mitchell, to you, I don't know if you agree with that comparison. I, I just see a methodological consistency. Absolutely. At the same time, fortunes of feminism and the critique you just you just gave uh, of the transition to neoliberalism and feminism's little role in it, that's absolutely devastating as a critique. There's similar stuff in here when you talk about the way that in the 19th century, um, family and society was conceptualized as a sort of bulwark against the, the, the you know, traumatic force of economy and capitalism. And so it could sometimes feel like feminists who are arguing for less conservative gender roles could seem like they were siding even then with economy over society. So I, I wonder if, if you sort of carry that sort of mixed feelings about your own tradition uh, with, with you throughout your work. Uh, well, I mean, I think I would uh, say, uh, first of all, that um, I mean, that, that feminism for me is a field of argument, uh, like all social movements, and it has uh, what we used to call bourgeois currents or liberal currents or even neoliberal currents, uh, as well as socialist currents uh, and, and uh, you know, and, and everything in between. Um, in a country like the U.S., um, the liberal currents became hegemonic as the new left waned. Um, and this is always the case in the United States. This liberal traditions, liberal individualism is very strong. It's only in rather exceptional moments of deep crisis and of um, political radicalization responding to that crisis, such as the 1930s, such as the 19th, 60s. Um, it's only in moments like that that significant social movements think structurally 
and incline themselves to anti-capitalism or anti-imperialism. Um, this was uh, the case in, in the 30s, surely, and then uh, devolves into right um, liberal anti-communism by the 1950s, uh, with a tragically uh, the support of labor movement, labor unions, the large labor movements, even for the Vietnam War, uh, uh, going uh, in, into the subsequent period. Um, you can tell this story about every social movement. Liberalism is the default position that every social movement embraces in one form or another, except in these special moments. So it's not surprising um, that feminism took that, uh, that, that the, what I should say is that the, the, the most hegemonic current of feminism became liberalism. Uh, and the other currents didn't disappear but became small, became marginal, um, were uh, failed to win a, um, a, any visibility in the media and, and so on and so forth. Now, I think actually today we are living in a, in a, in a, in a, in a different situation. I think this is a moment of general crisis, of the crisis, not just of care, but of nature, of uh, race and expropriation, of uh, democracy and, and of ecology. So I think that, that this is one of those moments where we could see, and to a certain extent have seen, a, a kind of, let's call it a, an unraveling of bourgeois liberal hegemony. And so we have an opening now for left alternatives, but also for very bad right-wing alternatives. A hegemonic crisis, um, an unraveling of bourgeois liberal hegemony is an opportunity for all, for the best and the worst, right, uh, to come out. And that's why we have seen, to go back to what we were talking about before, the Sanders slash Trump phenomenon the, 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 on both sides, something new. Uh, anti-neoliberal, anti-liberal uh, uh, alternatives of left and right. I am seeing um, much more left-wing feminist thinking and activism today. I think it's a uh, uh, it is a, a new ball game, and in which I see uh, exciting uh, left-wing feminist intellectual work the reemergence of what is of, of Marxist feminism today under the new label social reproduction theory. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you go to other parts of the world, I've been um, uh, paying a lot of attention to Latin America now. Um, uh, here, there, the, the feminist movement um, in Argentina and Brazil is immensely powerful, radical, and very left and very anti-capitalist. Um, we saw for a while in, in Spain and Italy that feminism, what, what, what I and my co-authors had, had called feminism for the 99%, which is the anti-liberal feminism, um, we saw that become the face of opposition to austerity, the defense of social reproduction against debt austerity, the IMF, and, and so on and so forth. So th this is a, there are opportunities here. Um, and I would say that, that social reproduction, which is again, that fancy word for care work, um, that's become the, a, a, a center of conflict, especially in places where um, manufacturing has declined and the historically powerful Unions in manufacturing have been weakened. Who, where is the front line of struggle? S nurses strikes, teachers strike. This is social reproduction, and um, and uh, housing activism, and um, urban environmental activism, and all. This is all about care and social reproduction. So I think that I, I'm, despite the fact that I said before, the right has. Uh, at the political level, 
at least for now, edged out the left-wing alternatives that emerged, which included Podemos in, in Spain, Syriza in, in, in Greece. Well, we still now have the, the new uh, Lula uh, government back in, in Brazil and so on. Um, okay, uh, Sanders in the US. Um, we had, a, we, the, we, these movements show me that there are left-wing opportunities to be seized. And I don't, I do not uh, accept that it's game over here. I do not. Um, well, I mean, yeah. as you're on the, the topic, I, I do want to get you on ecology, but let's jump to yeah. the, the, the final uh, of, of the four threads first and, and loop back to it, if, if, if I may. Um, you, sure. you talk about democratization, and, and this, is a, this is a term that um, the left and the right uh, have had a lot to say about sovereignty, right. Um, uh, the critique of globalization, critique of international, um, sorry, you know, international, uh, transnational right. power, etc. Um, I, I, th I thought, again, one of the sort of beautiful little sort of clarifying nuggets in the book is your critique of what you refer to as politicism, of, yeah. uh, as opposed to uh, economism. Yeah. Um, and I, I thought that there was a quite cutting, I don't know, I recognize the critique, actually, um, in in Britain with the Corbyn movement, quite a lot of the time you sort of felt like there was a there was a sense of being treated unfairly, which of course mm -hmm. we were. Mm -hmm. But you know what what were we imagining? A version where we are treated fairly by the existing bourgeois institutions and then get a fair hearing and, and win within them. Um, when actually the very so-called democratic structures that we have are so clearly. Um, opposed to our politics yeah. and the kind of transformation we're seeking. So I, I felt there was a critique of Chantal Mouffe there, perhaps. There was a critique of a lot of the left populist project. How should we be approaching questions of sovereignty, democracy, which clearly are coalition building subjects? People want to have command and want to have power. Right. Well, uh, this is, is a, an, another huge can of worms, just like the question of non-racial capitalism. Mm -hmm. uh, can we have a, a, a genuinely democratic capitalism? No, not th there. I feel quite clear that there's simple answer. Mm -hmm. And I think that these, um, these uh, sort of, I would call them nostalgic backward looking uh, projects that we could somehow resurrect um, social democracy in one country, uh, let alone socialism in one country. I, I don't think this makes any sense. I think that the sort of uh, the genie of uh, of globalization, financialization is so far out of the bag that yeah. there are no national solutions. And um, that is even apart from the more uh, familiar idea that a, a national solution here would come off the backs of the, those out over there. So uh, from the standpoint of global justice, it's, it's, it's not desirable. But beyond that, I actually just don't even think it's doable now. Possibly the United States, because the dollar is world money, could, keep, could just keep printing it. But um, part of the issue is, you know, there's also a, a geopolitical crisis with a kind of weakened uh, soul superpower flailing about uncontrollably, you know, intervening mm -hmm. here and there and, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, we could even uh, talk about the role of the United States in pushing NATO up to Russia's doorstep and, and you know, without in any way Absolutely. wanting to yeah. defend Putin. But uh, anyway, there's a very threatening uh, geopolitical situation with the United States taunting uh, China over raising Taiwan issues again and so on and so forth. Anyway, um, there's that whole, you, you, you don't have social democracy without a... A, a, a global financial right uh, uh, and, and trade regime that allows for it. So I think that the people, the the alter globalization activists of, of a few decades ago were absolutely right in trying to reveal the global architecture mm -hmm. of neoliberalism. Unless you challenge that, you can't have democracy anywhere. Because basically what neoliberalism has done 
has been um, to hardwire um, a whole set of relationships that prevent states from uh, passing environmental or labor legislation that gets defined as a restraint on trade. And the WTO disallows that. There's a very good, a couple of very good books on this, but I would recommend Quinn Slobodian's book, The Globalist, explains yeah. sort of how this was done, um, how it was conceived a long time ago and um, hatched uh, intellectually and politically. Um, there's also a good book um, uh, about the United States uh, by Nancy McLean called Democracy in Chains, which was about the not just the Friedmanite uh, economic story, but the Buchananite, James Buchanan, the story, the public choice, the sort of uh, what do you call what do you call it? Kind of um, um, hobbling uh, public power, chaining it to to economic private power. Okay, so um, the point is capitalism by definition devolves the power to organize production to profit-making enterprises which become ever bigger and more untethered and free to roam and, you know, uh, and to cannibalize. And um, they are basically in charge of our relation to nature. That's what production is after all they are in charge of uh, how much money can be spent uh, on social programs because the, the financial system just will, you know, the investors will just go after any country that is diverting too much of their resource to social spending as opposed to paying you know, debt service. They're, they control so much of our lives and we don't even think about what real democracy would mean, what public control over those things would mean, what democratic control over social surplus would mean, about how investment, how social energy is allocated. We are just t t thinking about the pathetically impoverished existing forms of democracy that we have, which it's true, even those are being eroded. But my God, let's be ambitious. Let's think big. If you want democracy, let's take the control away from, from Shell, from Exxon Mobil, from you know uh, all the hedge funds and 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 Wall Street and Silicon Valley. Let they basically control our life form. Where, where, where's the democracy in that? All they care about is shareholder value and, and, and profit. So I think this is what I mean about politicism. The idea that there's a political fix is wrong. There is no mm. political fix that does not challenge the relation between state and market, between public power and private power in the same way that there's no solution to care that doesn't challenge the production reproduction division, there's no solution to ecology that doesn't challenge, right, again, the, 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 the corporate uh, nature, uh, corporate control of the nature. Well, take us into to that. I mean, in a way, the the, the nature arguments um, you, it's the one that not not you alone, but that uh, you you write about with the most urgency. It also strikes me that it's the one where you feel that we're least there, that, that the available actors are getting it most wrong out of the uh, out of the four um, uh, factors analysed. Um, the Green New Deal went from being a sort of niche academic idea to being in the 2019 Labour Manifesto, the 2020 mm -hmm. Bernie program, and, and now all of a sudden it, it's uh, it's a reactionary centrist Democrats president's policy. It's the EU's policy, although without the new, just in case anyone thought it was going to be democratic. Um, uh, and indeed, uh, until he was ousted, it was Boris Johnson's policy. So suddenly across the spectrum, our idea has been embraced. Why aren't you Happy about that, Nancy Fraser. Well, like everything, um, you know, uh, democracy is is embraced by by everybody. Uh, you know, uh, uh, 
gender equality is embraced uh, by everybody except for you know a few uh, sort of Neanderthal types, uh, whatever. Um, no, but the point is, uh, once you get the idea out there that there's a real problem here, that climate change is real, that we have to do something, then of course, everybody is going to get into the act. And that's when the real battle for hegemony begins. That's when we have to get in there and show why and how these various alternatives that are sort of green capitalist or market friendly uh, or, you know, trading emissions permits and offsets and let, let the market handle it. We have to show why these things are completely scams. These will not work. They are just new profit opportunities for Goldman Sachs and, 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 and company. So, um, that the fact that that climate change is now on the agenda, it's something that everybody has to have a view about. That's, you know, better than denialism for sure, but it's just the beginning of the, the, the struggle if, for, of the left, first of all, to develop what a real left proposal would be. And it's got to be one that is pro-working class and that is anti-racist and anti-misogynistic and 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 democratic and, and anti-imperialist. I mean, and, for, for a while, the the absolutely. EU messaging was that fossil fuels are bad because they're Russian, right. uh, and uh, you know, right. the, the, if you're for NATO, you're you're for the fight against climate change. Uh, degrowth seems to be the official economic policy of the UK at this point, uh, right. as you point out in the book, which. What are you talking about growing when you talk about degrowth? Right. We're, uh, that's the whole problem. The whole language of are you for or against growth is crazy. We have to talk about what should grow and what should not grow. Capital should not keep growing. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, emissions should not keep growing. That doesn't mean that the good uh, food and, and, and health care and safe and attractive housing and all of that uh, transportation and, and, and communication shouldn't grow. Uh, use values, let's go back to Mark. Use value needs to grow. Exchange value, mm -hmm. not so much. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's as good a, a concluding point uh, as any uh, for the growth of use value. Um, cannibal capitalism, I, I hope that the show has sh uh, suggested to listeners. It's an absolutely fantastic book, and there's a hell of a lot to learn in it, but a, a lot of bracing and motivating political critique uh, to take on board in the movements as well. Nancy Fraser, we can't thank you enough for joining us on The Popular Show. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure and a lot of fun, uh, exciting to talk to you. Thanks.